lovely to listen. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk to Professor Jen Dowd, Associate Professor of Demography and Population Health at the University of Oxford. Now, look, this is looking this is looking like a very difficult and disconcerting situation, Professor. We've got lots of children at home from school with temperatures and coughs. They can't get a test here in London at all. I've just heard from somebody, uh, um, in fact, an esteemed colleague of mine saying, uh, you fill in 100 details and then it says, sorry, there are no tests. Indeed, Vanessa, that is a very disconcerting situation. We've only had just had our, our kids get back to school. Um, and I think we relied on a, a kind of misconception that kids, you know, wouldn't be as likely to get sick and not as likely to transmit. Um, but of course, we're learning that that's not the case. Um, we're very fortunate that kids very rarely have severe disease. But we're seeing more and more clearly that they can transmit. Um, and that's why it's even more important for us to keep, you know, broad community transmission down so that our kids can attend school safely. But I agree with the backlog and testing is a huge obstacle to keeping those overall transmission rates down because we simply don't know where we should put out those fires and, and do the appropriate contact tracing. I mean, in a way, and I don't like to say this, I don't want to say this, and it isn't really my job to come to conclusions and start <laughs> telling people what I think about stuff. But, but isn't this the worst of all possible worlds? I mean, I really mean it. You know, the figures are rising. <laughs> It's not funny, is it? The figures are rising. No. We've got the rule of six, which means that we can't even see the people that we love that we haven't seen for months anyway and have barely only just become reacquainted with. The figures right. are rising. At the moment, um, we spoke to um, a professor just earlier in the programme and he says at the moment there aren't that many people in hospital and there aren't that many people in intensive care, but that will follow right. in about a month from the rising figures. That's a given. And children all over London and the country beyond, of course, are going down with coughs and temperatures, and they can't get the test, which says it's not COVID, they can go back to school. So people are having to isolate for no reason. They can't go to work. They can't make a living. It's difficult enough to make a living anywhere. This is really very difficult. It's a, a, a horrible, when people talk about a perfect storm, this is a storm of imperfections, isn't it? It is. It's, ter it's terrible timing with the beginning of the school year and, and the encouragement that we recently had to go back to work in person. You know, to do that without a proper testing regime that has very quick turnaround times is incredibly unrealistic. Um, I completely agree. And our children are really suffering from, you know, this, you know, going in between distance learning and online school and back and forth. Um, and we're going to see very long term repercussions of that in the education system. So, you know, several weeks ago, I was very, I thought we were in a much better situation than some countries with low levels of transmission and opening schools. But that has sort of changed overnight. Um, and I agree, it's, it's a very concerning situation. And if you hesitate in this phase of sort of exponential growth to, to act upon it, um, it can really get out of control fast, as we saw in early March. Right. Okay, we've established that. Now, what do we say? <laughs> what do we do? Yeah, what do we do? Um, what do we say? What can we say after that? Because people are trying their best to do the right thing, to be as safe as they can. To you know, to, and 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 you know, we we had my colleague who was coughing. We thought it was just an ordinary cough. He was sure it was from having been on a plane. He tried uh, to get the test. He phoned twenty five times, and he was told in London he could get a test in Dundee or Aberdeen or something. Um, you know, yeah. he had to take a whole week off work. He should have been here working. He couldn't. He worked from home, you know. And, and then all these people with the children coughing at home. What are they supposed to do? That, I mean, they're really, their hands really are tied without the testing capacity, which, which is really the government's responsibility. Um, but really staying home if you do have any symptoms is, is the next best thing you can do, um, even with the high costs of that for work and school. Um, because if it continues to kind of spread out of control, unfortunately, Minimizing social contact is the only way we can, you know, the only other tool we have to to kind of stop the spread of this um, wildfire, so to speak. Um, and so, um, you know, these new rules, I think clear, consistent messaging from the government is actually really important to limit large gatherings, which I think this is the intention of this rule. Um, you know, but ultimately, we do have to, to limit social contact, um, but also put pressure on the government to make sure that these, you know, the testing regime can can make sure that society can function as normal and, and protect people. This is very difficult indeed, isn't it? Because you can see how people will just think, well, beep this. 
You know, I've tried my best. I don't think it's anything serious. I cannot have another week with my kid at home. I just can't, or I really can't afford not to go to work. You know, I've tried to get a test. I've tried to do the right thing. I just can't. It's like when you want to throw something in a bin and you can't find a bin and you're looking and looking and looking. <laughs> Eventually, people reach a tolerance level and a limit. And they think, well, I'm throwing it in the road because I can't find a bin. It's not my fault. I've tried my best. People who've been phoning and phoning and phoning, you know, and trying to get a test Absolutely. they can't get. What, what are they supposed to do? What, what, I mean, well, we know the answer. They're meant to stay at home for 14 days. But my Lord, how many times can that happen every time someone in your child's class has a cough? I know it's it's really inexcusable the the lack of testing and and it it doesn't you know comport with what um, the capacity that's being advertised so um, you know someone really does need to answer for that and and the turnaround times and these distances that people have to travel um, is just ridiculous and and I know there's a hope that we can move to even you know more rapid testing that people might be able to do at home that's not on the immediate horizon. Um, but that's something that could be a really good tool for helping people navigate these really ambiguous situations where, um, yes, you can't keep your kid home all the time. Kids always have the sniffles or something going on, um, and it's going to be almost impossible to expect people to comply with that. I, I completely agree. So what do you see? What do you see um, unfolding then? I know you have to look into your crystal ball as a professor <laughs> of, of yes. demography and population health. That's what you have to do anyway. So what do you think? I, Yes, my epidemiological crystal ball. Um, I could make a lot of money if it was if it were accurate. It's it's tough. I, I am glad that we're taking some steps to emphasize limiting large gatherings. I think that has been something that probably fueled the increase in the last few weeks. Mm. Um, but at the same time, since that circulation sort of within families is already happening, you know, going back to schools, um, unfortunately, is going to contribute to that spread. So um, I think we we have to emphasize, you know, to everyone as much as we can to, to limit their social contact, um, you know, especially crowded indoor spaces um, of long duration and sort of loud talking, which, of course, is sort of indoor dining and pubs and things that we were excited to get back to. Um, and to really give our kids the best chance of staying in school, um, I personally think we need to encourage, um, you know, face coverings much more broadly in schools. It's been kind of a mystery to me why the government um, was so slow to recommend that. And then, you know, not for all situations, um, just in corridors, which is actually really passing contact. It's sort of classrooms where people are sitting for a long time and the, you know, the virus can accumulate in the air in small rooms. So I think we need to use every tool at our disposal, really. Um, you know, you're the prevention. first person to say that on the show. First person. No, you are. <laughs> Is though. that right? Yeah. Okay. Nobody else no, has I, said that. No one else. I, you know, kids around the world who are very young are doing this with no problem. I think we really underestimate kids. They, they're actually much better at these new routines than we are. And especially if you tell them that it helps protect other people, they're, they're fully on board with this. Well, thank you so much um, for talking to us. We're going to underline this so people don't not hear it. Thank you very much indeed. Now, this is Professor Jen Dowd, Associate Professor of Demography and Population Health at the University of Oxford, saying, why aren't children wearing masks in schools?